Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 653rd New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Judah Shift, Jared Shanahan, and Abby Kniff. We're also thrilled to welcome poet, writer, Alsop here to close out today's program. And before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for an actual and necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking of. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts. Um, Judah Sheft is a professor in the School of Justice Studies at Eastern Kentucky University. Grounded in the interdisciplinary field of critical prison studies, his work examines the history, political economy, and cultural logics of the carceral state. He is the author of Coal Cages in Crisis, which we'll be discussing today, and Progressive Punishment, Job Loss, Jail Growth, and Neoliberal Logic of Carceral Expansion, among others. Abby Kniff is a PhD student in Environmental Studies at University of California, Santa Cruz. Kniff researches at the intersection of climate justice and prison studies, focusing on the role of labor within climate-induced disaster response. And Jared Shanahan is a writer, activist, and educator based in Chicago. He is an assistant of criminal justice at a professor, an assistant professor at a criminal justice of criminal justice at Governor State University and University Park, Illinois, and the author of Captives, How Rikers Island Took Over New York City Hostage, among other publications. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Um, so grateful to be here and I'm excited to pass it over to you, Abby. Thank you so much for that introduction, Eleanor. Again, thank you all for joining us today for a conversation with Judah Shept about his new book, Coal Cages Crisis, out from NYU Press. As researchers grappling with integrating environmental justice into a political economic analysis of prisons, Jared and I are so excited at the opportunity to hear more from Judah about this massive contribution to our field. Building on his previous work about jail expansion in Indiana, Coal Cages Crisis cracks open the trends of rural prison construction in environmentally and economically distressed regions of Eastern Kentucky. While we were reading the book earlier this summer, we were blown away by the multifaceted and cap capacious approach um, that it employs to incorporate such a broad range of source material from participant observation, interviews with activists, records from many different levels of government and serious archival work. Throughout all of it, Judah argues that prisons took shape in and shaped central Appalachia in the midst of crisis. So Judah, we wanted to start off this conversation by asking how this book fits into your life in Eastern Kentucky since you have been involved in work and organizing there for over a decade. Can you tell us about what it has taught you about mass incarceration? Yeah, thanks so much for that intro, Abby. Um, hey, everybody, uh, it's great to be here with you all. Um, excited to chat about the book with you and to chat with my friends and comrades, Abby and Jared. Um, thanks to the Brooklyn Rail so much for the invitation. Thanks to Jared and Abby for engaging so um, generously and deeply with it in the review that they wrote, which is in the in the Brooklyn Rail. Um, and yeah, thanks for being for being here in conversation. So, I think to answer that question, Abby, I would begin maybe by just like laying out some basic, um, I don't know, like facts and parameters about this thing that we call mass incarceration. Uh, just to make sure we're sort of all on the same page and then to also serve as kind of like a point of departure for answering the question. So I assume we probably are all somewhat familiar with what mass incarceration is and, and sort of looks like. 
um, there's sort of like well rehearsed numbers that we often use to tell the story. 2.3 million people incarcerated in prisons and jails. I think three or four more million on probation and parole. You know, the United States being something like 6% of the world's population, but accounting for 22% of the world's incarcerated population. Um, and those numbers are really important and, and they definitely tell um, a part of the story. The thing is, is that we wouldn't be able to put so many people in, in cages um, without having a lot of jails and prisons in, in which to put them. And so as we've put more and more people inside, it's a growth of like something like four or 500% over the last four or five decades. We've also built literally hundreds and hundreds of new prisons. In total, something like 350 new prisons have been opened um, in rural parts of the United States since about 1980. Um, and that includes, you know, all kinds of places, upstate New York, Central Valley of California, places in Colorado and Illinois, like all over the place. But there are a few regions which taken together account for kind of a greater share of those 350 new prisons. And one of those regions, which accounts for a large share is central Appalachia, which is a sub-region of Appalachia that is east, all of Eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, Southwestern Virginia, and parts of Tennessee. Um, so there's a lot of prisons built in that area, particularly in Eastern Kentucky. Most of them have been built in recent history, like the last 30 years, like I said. And actually here, Eleanor, if, I wanna come back to the image that you have up, but if you'll skip ahead one image, it'll show, it should show, yeah, that one. This gives you a sense of what this kind of dense and sprawling prison geography looks like. Just a quick note about this. Many of the prisons that you see on this map are federal prisons, which is sort of like the product of the lobbying power of US Congressional Representative Hal Rogers, who represents all of Eastern Kentucky. But there are also state prisons. There are also private prisons. And there are a growing and large number of jails. Um, so, so that means there's sort of like carceral facilities at various scales of the state, the federal scale, the state scale, and the county level. Um, I was kind of interested in thinking about this kind of dense carceral geography and asking some very basic questions. Like why, why did this happen? Why are there so many prisons here? Why in this region in particular? Why in this moment in time? How do folks feel about them? What are they doing? Like what's their broader sort of work in these communities? Um, and in asking those kinds of questions, I think it helped me recognize in this particular place, it helped me recognize the importance of thinking sort of beyond certain categories of like crime and punishment to try and explain this and to really understand that that what this is is the way that the state itself has transformed has transformed in and through these institutions and capacities. Um, if you'll go back to that first photograph real quick, um, I think this is like one way that, to answer Abby's question, this photograph I think speaks to one way that the region has helped my understanding of mass incarceration. So the book that we're talking about today um, relies on a few different methods as, as Abby laid out, uh, and it has a bunch of photography in it. I worked with, with a friend and colleague who's a photographer. This is one of her earliest images. And what this depicts, um, this image has been really generative for me. It's really helped me understand what it even was I was doing in the book uh, and in the research. And what it depicts is um, the interface in the landscape, the meeting in the landscape between a prison, which is of course the, the fence on the right side of the image, and an old coal seam, um, like a site of mining on the left side. And so it depicts their literal like contiguity, their meeting in the landscape. Um, but slightly more abstractly, I think it speaks to the place that I wanted to try and felt like I needed to try and occupy to better understand the rise of the prison in this region, which is to say just to think about the prison as a set of relationships, 
a set of relationships to what they share space with and what came before them. So thinking about them this way, I think um, confirmed to me that their prisons and jails are really sort of central to understanding the ways that all kinds of communities, but particularly these communities, are navigating through various elements of what we call sort of racial capitalist crisis, including at what we might think of as like the point of production, meaning just like work, but also at what scholars call social reproduction, which is really just the way that we reproduce ourselves in the world, the way that we can like imagine and work towards futures in the places we live. And so what it sort of taught me over time, like it, it kind of took me a while to figure this out, was that the prisons in the region and the jails as well actually are as much about things like budgets and revenue and deindustrialization and um, development, like community development efforts, and infrastructure extension and work and wages and education and various sort of surpluses of land and people. It's as much about all, as, as much if not more about all of it, all of that, than it is about crime, punishment, overcrowding, treatment, things that we tend to think about as orbiting more closely to sort of the field of, of criminal justice. Thanks, Judah. Um, and thanks again for writing this excellent book that everybody should all check out. <laughs> thanks, Jared. Um, and so there's actually a number of my History of Corrections students in the house, as they say. Um, and so this one, this, this question's for them. Um, you know, as you demonstrate, uh, Appalachia has a unique history. It's a very specific regional history. Um, it is. How did this history shape the particular arrangement of land, labor, and capital that we see in Appalachian incarceration patterns today? Yeah. I think I'd wanna say a couple, I'd wanna answer that in a couple ways. Like on the one hand, I think it's really important to say that in some ways, central Appalachia resembles a lot of the other places where prisons have been built over the last 40 years, like rural deindustrialization and population decline, surplus land, people really living um, actively experiencing or at least on the edges of economic precarity. And I really think that's important to note. Like, I'm, I totally agree with you, and we're going to sort of get into it here that it does have a very specific regional history. But I also think it's important to say it actually shares a lot in common with upstate New York and the Central Valley of California and all these other places where prisons have been built because that resemblance can be the footing or the foundation from which lines of support and solidarity are forged. So I wanna just kind of stipulate that, but, but I, I also think, and as you sort of indicated with the question, um, regional history matters a lot and it matters because the historical forces of capitalism and state power um, contour places differently, which is just to say that there are like, sorry, my dog is sort of freaking out, that there are um, distinct features of Appalachian history that I think are important to detail. And then actually, even with that distinctive regional history, there are, um, I'm not sure what the right metaphor is, but there's like different veins of that history that structure different places within the region differently, right? So it's like a regional history that I think is important to acknowledge. And then also specific ways that regional history manifests differently in different places. Of course, she's barking. She's been quiet all day. Zelda. Sorry, everybody. She's cute, but she's loud. Um, maybe one way to talk about this is to point to a few specific places and the way that this specific, this kind of regional history played out in specific ways. So actually, Eleanor, if you'll go to, I think it should be slide three. Um, it's actually the same, yeah, that one. So it's the same community of that 
first image. It's a very small community called Wheelwright, Kentucky, which is a former uh, company town. Um, so this is a town that was literally developed by a by the coal industry. And there were hundreds of them around the coal, coal fields. So a coal company would move in, it would build out a town, it owned everything in the town. And it was a way to have a very kind of captive and ideally for them, docile population of supply of workers. So coal companies developed this place called Wheelwright um, in 19... It, they founded the town in 1916, a little over 100 years ago. And then for the next 60 years, sort of bought and sold between different companies, all of which own the town, which of course meant that residents of the town were sort of dependent on the coal company for just about everything from money to, um, of course, work to places to live to where they recreated and all of that. By the time the last coal company sort of sold the town or sort of by the, by the time the town gained independence in the early 1980s, it had been dependent for so long on its corporate ownership that it never really had a chance. And the, you know, there's lots of statistics that speak to sort of how um, desperate, economically desperate this place is like median income is something like $7,000 in, in this town itself. Um, so the state in the early 1990s uh, worked with a private prison company to open a prison. It should be the next photo in the slideshow. And this is the prison, the exterior of which was in that first image. So this prison opened in the early 90s. It had a very um, kind of uh, violent and distressing 20 year history. It was a private prison owned by a private prison company. It closed in 2012, and in fact, it was just reopened last year as a state prison. The state of Kentucky is now leasing it from a coal, from uh, sorry, not from the coal company, from the private prison company. So the point here just being one vein of this regional history, I think to me, uh, is the through line for this particular place. And that specific vein is like the long legacy of company towns and their sort of reliance on um, police and also uh, you know, a kind of like captive labor population. So that's one to say. Uh, in other communities that the book examines, what seemed most salient was not necessarily like a company town, but the ways that the coal industry itself changed over history, particularly with respect to how it shifted production which, and I'm thinking really specifically here of it becoming increasingly mechanized, which meant it shifted away from really labor dependent, labor heavy, deep mining, kind of like you're probably for people on this call, if you're imagining coal mining, you're probably imagining somebody deep underground mining coal. Um, the industry shifted away from, from that approach kind of mid 20th century, um, towards a heavily mechanized form of mining. And, and that did sort of two things at once that I think are really consequential to our conversation today, thinking about prisons. One, both of which I think we're gonna talk about here in a minute. One is it created something called mountaintop removal, which is a process of mining coal that creates these, ultimately creates these really vast plains of land in an area that's otherwise, um, whose topography is otherwise, of course, like constituted by mountains and deep valleys. So it created really like kind of like the spatial conditions to even imagine building a big prison on. The other thing it did is it resulted in the precipitous decline of employment. So it's sort of like two surpluses. It created the availability of land or what we could think of as surplus land, available land, and it created people um, whose labor had become sort of newly available by the fact that coal jobs had declined so much. So that's kind of like the second vein of regional history, I would wanna say. One last one um, that I think is expressed really in really interesting ways in a different place. And I think this should be the next one or two images is in 
Oh, it's actually, so it's actually a couple past this, Eleanor. It's like image eight and nine, maybe. Um, it's a place in Tennessee. Yeah, it's that one. So it's a place in Tennessee that I write about. Um, it's a really bizarre place. I, I, I'm not going to really get into it too much today, other than just to say today it's not a prison. It's a site of prison tour, prison and like eco tourism. It's really, really weird. Um, if people are interested in hearing more about it, I can talk about it um, during like our discussion or whatever. The reason I bring it up here is because. This was a state prison. It was the second state prison built in Tennessee. It was built in 1896, I think, and it closed in 2009. Why it's important for, for, for this particular um, part of Jared's question is that before it was a prison, this area where it was built in Tennessee was the site of this really incredible insurrection like uprising by unionized miners against the convict lease system. That lasted for a year, it came to be known as the Coal Creek War and which effectively ended convict leasing in the state of Tennessee. Um, they sort of waged war on coal companies, they liberated convicts, they burnt down the stockades in which they were incarcerated and it pushed the state of Tennessee and the convict lease system into crisis. And the way that the state of Tennessee managed that crisis was to end convict leasing, but then to build Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary, this prison. So this is what you're looking at here is an old mining entrance in this area, just outside the prison. What the prison or what the state did was build Brushy Mountain and then purchase the surrounding 10,000 acres where there were mines. And what they did was instead of using convict labor to mine coal, they just forced prisoners to mine coal for the state of Tennessee. And this lasted into the 1960s. The prison would house um, four people to a cell where they had just two bunks and they would have two people working 12 hour shifts in the mines. And there was like, you know, lots of mine disasters and lots of violence in the mines. Um, but there is another sort of vein of this I think regional history to name, right? Like the way that it, it in a number of these cases, the sort of prison um, is proposed and actually grows as a response to sort of a crisis in the coal industry, right? Many of which are crises that we should understand as kind of endemic to capitalism itself. Awesome. Yeah. So those are three really big things that we're going to keep diving into. I have one thing I wanted to mention for anyone who is wondering if they can ask you to questions. We're actually asking that if you have questions now, you can add them to the chat and we'll um, address them in the Q&A or you can keep them, write them down and um, we'll have a, a moment at the end where we can have audience questions as well. Um, I know there were a lot of things where you're like, I can talk more about this later. So I wanted to make sure everyone <laughs> was felt like they knew when to ask. Um, but so yeah, the next question that I wanted to ask you was kind of just diving a little bit more into the specific relationship between jobs that you were talking about and prisons. So the yeah. decline of the coal industry, because we often think about mass incarceration as deindustrialization, like you were talking about, like happening in the late 20th century, there's a loss of jobs because the manufacturing is moving out of the US. And, but that kind of, we think about it on national trends, like bit, like all these different, like small companies that are happening at the same time, there's certain types of industries like are like, I don't know, like yeah, over a progression, but your case study was able to look at like one specific industry over a really, finite amount of time and you could see these jobs really disappearing. Um, so I wanted you to, if you would be willing to tell us a little bit more about the relationship you found between coal, between prisons popping up across Appalachia and the local labor markets around these areas. Totally. Yeah. I mean, to me, this is like maybe the crucial question to ask um, because to start with the most explicit and most dominant narrative that supports all of these prisons being built is that narrative that Abby's talking about, that they will be the, a new form of economic development for deindustrialized rural communities in central Appalachia, primarily through providing sustainable and well-paid employment, right? That is really like the dominant discourse that supports prison growth. 
So there's a few things to say here um, that are a little bit in tension to, um, to be frank. So just a couple numbers that I think, I don't wanna you know, um, rely on these too heavily, but I think they, they tell part of the story and an important part of the story. So employment in the coal industry really peaked in like 1949 or 1950. There were 75,000 miners who worked in Kentucky in 1950, 75,000, right? It was uh, split between the coal fields in Eastern Kentucky, what we think of as Appalachia and also Western Kentucky, which is not Appalachia, but it was heavily concentrated in Eastern Kentucky, 75,000. Today in 2022, there are just under 4,000 coal jobs left in the state, right? So it was 75,000 today, it's 4,000. And half of more than, maybe more than half or about half are in Western Kentucky. So we're talking about just a couple thousand jobs left. And that's not just mining jobs, that's in the industry as a whole. So it's really been a precipitous decline in coal employment. So that's 4,000 coal jobs left. At that same, in the same moment today, 4,000 coal jobs in Kentucky, there are something like 6,500 prison jobs in the state of Kentucky. Actually, I should be even more specific. Those are correctional officer jobs. So those 6,500 don't actually count all of the social workers and nurses and educators and whatnot who work inside of prisons. So I don't think it's um, an exaggeration to say that jobs in sort of corrections have eclipsed jobs in coal mining by like thousands and thousands of positions. So there's on the one hand, a kind of easy argument to make here about prison jobs replacing coal jobs, right? Because in part, that is what's happened. Um, but think about it like this too. You look, we saw that map before. There's this like super dense concentration of prisons and jails in the region. And yet the number of correctional officer jobs is not even a 10th of what coal mining jobs were at the height of coal mining employment, not even a 10th. So it's not really the case that they are, that the prisons are providing some new economic future for the region in the form of employment, right? It's not even remotely approaching the coal industry, not even close. So if that's not what's happening, um, then what is happening? Like what's, what's the sort of strength of this narrative or what's kind of granting it some credibility? I think it's a few things. It's um, even as the prisons don't materialize a lot of actual jobs, they do perform sort of important material and ideological work in the region, um, which is just to say that they do operate as a way for people to, again, like, plan for a future for themselves and for their communities and constituents and families. So a couple ways that this happens that I think are important to name. Um, one is as the coal industry declined, the industry really sort of offloaded the burden and the cost for social reproduction onto communities and households. Um, and the prisons, you know, do in some ways enable communities to address what to me are like very kind of everyday mundane examples of maintenance, like maintaining one's community, right? So the prison, the prospect or promise or presence of a prison in a lot of these places enab has enabled communities to like update a water treatment plant, literally to like pave a road to or uh, to extend water lines from a county seat out to a more rural part of the county where the prison was going to be. There's one quote um, that I think speaks to this. I made a note to read it from the book. It's a really short one, but I think it speaks to a lot of this. So this is actually from that same community in Wheelwright that we were talking about a few minutes ago when that prison that had been closed was gonna reopen. The judge executive, which is like, you know, the head county um, 
politician for, the, for, for that county, said the following about the prison reopening. He's the, just to reiterate, he's the judge executive of Floyd County. And he said, 200 people, meaning 200 people who might work there, plus their family members, that's gonna be visiting our restaurants, our gas stations, it'll bring housing to our community. It'll help clean it, meaning the prison, will help clean the city up, clean ditches up, you know, new infrastructure. So all in all, it's a great thing. So in a lot of ways, the prison enables these very, like I was saying before, kind of like everyday mundane aspects of maintaining a community to occur. The other thing I wanna be sure to mention, um, which goes, I think, to the heart of Abby's question, is that even as the jobs haven't really materialized in any way that approaches the promises offered by their supporters of like, you know, thousands of new, very stable jobs, um, it has affected the way that communities think about the prospect of employment in the prison and prepare for it. And lots of community or county um, people involved in all kinds of things, like people who work in rural healthcare and community centers and education, sort of imagine the sustainability and survivability of their industries through the prospect of building this prison. And specifically, schools in a number of places that have built these prisons or are expecting to build them have actually reorganized whole entire programs, developed whole entire programs and reorganized curricula and even built out infrastructure like a mock courtroom and a firing range and whatnot to prepare students to become a labor force for jobs in the carceral economy. So in anticipation of what folks thought would be the newest prison in the region just a few years ago, a prison called United States Penitentiary Letcher, which I think we'll talk about here in a few minutes. County high schools and vocational schools and community colleges all built out like criminal justice tracks and hired criminal justice teachers and partnered with a four-year university to offer bachelor's degrees in criminal justice, all in anticipation of this one prison and in recognition of the surrounding prisons with the idea of helping to sort of build out a new correctional labor force. And I think just the one quickly, one quick final point here before I, I turn it back to y'all. I think we have to sort of reckon with how racialized that process is. Um, we should know first that many rural prison towns in the United States are thoroughly multiracial, right? I think we sometimes hear rural and just imagine white people, and that's just not the case um, in many places around the United States. However, in Eastern Kentucky, many of the rural communities home to these prisons are largely, if not almost exclusively white. And so what seems to be, to me, what seems to be happening here in this sort of renovation of regional, kind of like economy and politics and even identity around the carceral facility, around the prison, around the jail, um, is the kind of taking of people whose parents, grandparents, uncles uh, were employed by the coal industry and who themselves could be prepared and educated to, to do literally anything, right? Like, you know, they could, they could, be trained and educated to do literally anything are being prepared to be the next iteration of prison guards. And it's a thoroughly sort of racialized project in the sense of the prison often bringing people who share a lot, who otherwise share a lot in common under capitalism in terms of sort of their relationship to work, their class position, et cetera, bringing them into the prison through two very different processes, criminalization on the one hand and employment on the other, right? And those are often sort of two different and differently racialized groups of people. And I think that's also really important to name. 
Thanks. Um, I'd like to go back to something that Abby talked about for a minute, um, which is this uh, practice of mountaintop removal. Now, I must confess to my great shame, I learned actually what it was through your book. I had heard it many times and I didn't realize that it was literally the removal of mountaintops. So maybe you could say a little bit about the practice of mountaintop removal, right? Um, and in, in, in my classes, my students here today have heard me say this, like, like just trust me, this is related to the part of the <laughs> system. Just try, just bear with me for a minute, I swear, I'm gonna relate it to prisons. Uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about the mountaintop removal and how it has this very particular relationship to incarceration in, in Appalachia that you, that you document so well. Yeah, I mean, I, I will also admit, Jared, like I had heard the term and I don't think I really understood what it was until I traveled to Eastern Kentucky and other parts of the region as part of the project. You know, so I really just came to it um, doing the research for the book over the last 10 years. Um, Eleanor, if you could go, I, I don't know if you have to go forward or back, but to the images of kind of like the flat expanse of land, I think we went past them before. Yeah, that one, that's great. So this is the top of a mountaintop removal site, right? It looks like this huge, and it is, this huge flat hundred of acre expanse of land. This is the site um, on which USP Letcher, United States Penitentiary Letcher that I just mentioned, what would have been the newest prison in the region, the 17th prison in the region had it been built. This is where it was gonna be built. And it's crazy being on top of this place, um, being on a mountaintop removal site. So Jill, my the photographer friend and I would travel to these places and drive up them and, and take photos and, and sort of talk to folks and, and think through um, what this all means. So what, what you're looking at is what's left after the top of a mountain has essentially been decapitated. Mountaintop removal is by far the most sort of violent, ruthless, destructive form of coal mining. One of the people I interviewed for the book called it strip mining on steroids. Um, literally, it relies on vast amounts of explosives, ammonium, nitrate, and ammonium, nitrate and fuel oil, A-N-F-O. It relies on, um, on that combination to detonate rock, to access the coal from the top. So as opposed to like burrowing sometimes like, you know, miles underground to access the coal, it just blows the top off the top of a mountain and goes in that way. So during the height of this practice, maybe 10 to 15 years ago, the amount of explosives used to do this was something like 2,500 tons of explosives or 5 million pounds of explosives per day in central Appalachia, per day. And this is devastating. Like I said, it blows off the top of the mountain. It takes everything that was up there, trees, vegetation, soil, right? And pushes it off which then goes down into the valleys below, often including into streams. And it of course has devastating effects for, for water flow, for um, wildlife, like for all of that, right? Um, something like 500 mountains have been brutally sort of decapitated in this way in central Appalachia. Um, the law says that a coal company following the practice of mountaintop removal has to invest in restoring what they call the approximate original contour of the land. The, the, the coal company that does this is supposed to then um, reclaim it in some way, like planting trees, planting grasses, like you know, facilitating its restoration. That rarely happens because it's very easy. There's lots of loopholes for the coal company to do it, to get out of doing that. One of which is that there's this loophole in the law where if the company can show that something else besides like uh, restoration of the land can bring the landscape back to its original, approximate original contour, 
they don't have to pay for remediation. So if they can say, hey, we just did this, but we think or we have indication that a Walmart is gonna move in here or an investor is gonna build out housing units up here. Or recently what's happened is a so one or two solar farms has been built on an MTR site. If they can say one of those things, they can get out of actually paying to remediate the site. And for the last 25, 30 years, one of the ways that they've gotten out of doing that is saying, hey, the state, or the federal government is in fact gonna build a prison here. And numerous prisons in the area have been built on sites just like this. There's several in Southwestern Virginia. Uh, two, the two of Virginia's supermax prisons, they're identical. They were built in Southwestern Virginia in the nineties, both built on mountaintop removal sites. Other prisons in Eastern Kentucky. And like I said, this one was um, designated for a prison until that prison was defeated, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, so it's really like, it's striking. Like it's a striking feature of the landscape just in general. And then it's really striking to think about the sort of history of violence on the land. Yeah, well, so the, I mean, that's kind of what I study um, with looking at yeah. environmental studies and I, I look at prison, um, labor in the fire camps in California. But so I've been grappling for a long time with this question of like prisons and human health and ecological health. And how do we think about those three things in relation to each other? And so you're, the way you're talking about the coal industry having this like really serious, like, yeah, kind of unimaginable effect of like destroying the tops, cutting the tops of mountains off and like just dumping them somewhere else putting all of these chemicals in, in order to extract the um, coal and then creating ditches filled with unusable water. It's actually like really dangerous. Um, yes. There's all these kinds of environmental impacts that are kind of preceding the prisons and then the prisons themselves create conditions of ill health for people who are incarcerated in them. But one thing that there's a group called the Prison Ecology Project, um, which is a grassroots organization that has been doing this work for a really long time and has done a lot of really amazing work to elevate the voices of incarcerated people who are experiencing environmental harms and environmental injustice. They sometimes make the claim that prisons themselves as institutions harm the environment in addition to the ways that they harm the health of people incarcerated. So I wanted to ask you just like through your research that you've done on this, have you found any evidence to say that, to support the claims that they're making about prisons harming the environment? And do you think that they have a particular impact on the local ecosystems or on like climate or like carbon emissions on a broader scale? Mm -hmm. What have you found in your research? Yeah, I would, uh, let me say a couple of things at the outset. One is this is not like a major area of like my personal expertise. Like I have some thoughts about it that I wanna share, but I also wanna just acknowledge that this is Abby's area of expertise. And so Abby, you should circle back and, and tell us what you think too. Um, so there's, I guess there's a few ways that I would go about answering this. Um, Maybe the first place to start is sort of by using the example you gave. The Prison Ecology Project was involved in the attempt, at the successful attempt, to defeat the building of USP Letcher, which we're going to, I think, end by talking about in a few minutes. Um, they and several other organizations spent a lot of time and effort challenging the proposal to build USP Letcher on a number of different environmental grounds, which are important to name. One is that the prison, if it were to be built, it would directly threaten several species of animals located on that site in particular. A species of bat, and in fact, two different bat biologists weighed in uh, during this environmental process, weighed in to, to register their opposition and their concerns. So a species of bat, a species of salamander, um, and something else. Two, um, US, this place that you're looking at right now is just about a mile from 
one of the re only remaining stands of old growth forest in all of Eastern Kentucky and may maybe central Appalachia, like never, never, um, like trees that have never been cut. For this prison to be built, they would have to pave new roads and widen certain roads and whatnot. And it would probably threaten this final stand of old growth forest directly. So that was a second kind of avenue of, of environmental critique and also a way that the prison may have in fact directly harmed the local ecosystem. Third, it was adjacent to, this prison would have been adjacent to a property that did a ton of bird rehabilitation. And there were arguments that the prison's light pollution would really affect migratory birds as well as local raptors. Fourth, um, there were important arguments that, this is actually really crucial, I almost forgot to say this. There were important arguments from Prison Ecology Project and these other organizations that the, it was a federal prison, right? So the federal prison agency, the Bureau of Prisons, if this were built, could transfer prisoners from all over the, what's called the Mid-Atlantic region in particular, and, and maybe even all over the country, to reside here for any number of reasons. And people argued that in this region, which is characterized by high rates of all kinds of, you know, high cancer rates and black lung disease and things like that, that that would be unconstitutionally subjecting a population to environmental and public health hazards. And one specific thing to, to name here, which is really critical, is not that far from where this is in Eastern Kentucky, still in Appalachia, just a different part of Appalachia, the kind of Southwestern corner of Pennsylvania. So sort of like South of Pittsburgh and where Pennsylvania meets like West Virginia and Ohio, there's a federal prison called FCI Fayette. And it's built on an old coal ash dump site, a, a place where the toxic um, byproduct of coal mining uh, was stored. Prison was built on top of it, right? It should sound familiar, right? It's very similar to this. And prisoners who were locked up at FCI Fayette were getting sick and dying from cancer that they got through drinking the drinking contaminated water, right? So there is some evidence, right, that prisons do propose or at least exacerbate the environmental harms that do occur in these places and do so to a population that really doesn't necessarily have a lot of power to contest them. Thanks, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, Letcher um, because a lot of our uh, readers who we've talked to um, expressed enthusiasm about uh, checking out your book and in particular about the chapter where you outline the grassroots community struggle against the construction of the, the prison on the land that I believe we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were hoping that you could just say a little bit about this campaign. Um, you know, what, first of all, why were these people um, opposing um, the construction of this new prison? And then um, how did they win and get the, get the construction halted? Yeah, I mean, this is really crucial. Let me um, give a quick shout out to my co-author and comrade, Sylvia Ryerson, who the last chapter of the book, which is about this fight, like Jared is saying, I, I wrote it with Sylvia Ryerson, who um, has lived in Eastern Kentucky for a long time, is now a PhD student at Yale, who's, who wrote about all of this stuff uh, a long time ago, has been involved in all these fights. And so we, we wrote it together. Um, so like I, like Jared said, like I said before, the proposal for United States Penitentiary Letcher, what would have been the newest federal prison in the region, um, gained a lot of momentum in like 2015, 2016. It started through this official process that all these big federal construction processes have to go through, which is called the, uh, the NEPA process. It's like federal environmental review process that's required for building like a big federal prison. Part of that requirement involves open comment from the public, okay? Um, 
right around then 2015, 2016, various kind of like strains of opposition that were sort of occurring independently wound up coalescing into something of a coalition. Like Jared said, it had real deep roots in the county itself in Letcher County, but it also had central players from around the country, including inside of prison. The coalition included um, like challenges to the official environmental review process. Like I was just saying, it involved local property owners challenging whose property the Bureau of Prisons wanted to purchase to cite USP Letcher on top of. So it involved local property owners saying no <laughs> and challenging the Bureau of Prisons. And it included these local organizers, um, many of them really young and kind of recently politicized through various things like the Black Lives Matter movement, through their own participation in a radio show, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and who really struggled to try and shift local common sense around the economic supposed economic benefits of building the prison. Maybe I'll say just like a quick word about each of those groups and how instrumental they all were to this victory, right? I mean, that's the other thing to just like underline again and again is that this was a really historic example because these, I mean, the sad reality is like once a prison gets to the stage where it's kind of going into sort of like construction, it's almost never defeated. And these guys, these folks actually defeated it. Um, like it's not there, prison's not there. So for the, um, a quick point about each of those kind of strains of the, of, of the coalition, strands of the coalition, these national attorneys and environmental activists, including the group that Abby named the Prison Ecology Project and several others, like the Abolitionist Law Center and a couple of other groups, Many of them were pretty seasoned in challenging infrastructure and extraction projects through the law, but hadn't necessarily applied those tactics to a prison. Um, but they found a lot of like kind of overlapping and compatible strategy to use in just really kind of rigorously calling attention to the surrounding geography of coal mining and the environmental and public health threats it would pose to people who worked in and were incarcerated in the prison and the way that it would impact local ecology, right? So they were writing in during that public comment period, challenging the Bureau of Prisons on their own, on what they'd sort of ignored or what they tried to paper over and pushing the Bureau of Prisons to have to go kind of back to the, back to the drawing board and kind of revise and revise the environmental impact statement. So just kind of like delaying the process. A second strain, and actually, um, if, if we can go forward an image or two, there's a great photo of this one individual, a couple more, a few more after that, Eleanor. It should be of a, a man holding a bird. So this is, a, a, there he is. So this is um, a, a, a property owner, a resident of Letcher County named Mitch Whitaker who is a fourth generation resident of Letcher County. He is a master falconer. That's like an actual, you know, category of falconer. He trains other people to hunt with birds. Um, and he also rehabilitates injured birds of prey on his land, which sat adjacent to where USP Letcher would have been built. They would have bought, I think, 18 of his acres to build the prison. And when I, when I you know, Sylvie and I talked to him a bunch of times, other people talked to him. He was a really vocal opponent. And um, he really understood this fight as sort of the next iteration of outside interests trying to take his land. For his grandfather, whose land this had been, had fought off coal companies who had wanted to take his land to um, because of uh, owning the mineral rights underneath it, wanting to just mine coal or, or truck coal through his property, and his grandfather had fought them off. He now understood the Bureau of Prisons as wanting to do the same thing. Um, and I think crucially, that was the terrain on which he entered the coalition. It was really about like, you know, this is my land. It's important to my family, et cetera. I want to stay here. But 
by working with other organizers and activists who'd entered the coalition for different reasons, it also shifted and shaped his analysis of mass incarceration. And he became a critic of mass incarceration. You can sort of hear it in his analysis. You can see it in the things that he wrote, which is really kind of profound. Like he became really sort of politicized through the work. So that's Mitch and other landowners. Um, and then the th sort of third component um, should be maybe the next slide is uh, these local organizers in Letcher County. These young, mostly young people um, started a group called the Letcher Governance Project, which really understood opposition to the prison as really a claim for grassroots democracy and as an intervention into sort of the long history of corporate control in the coal fields. Like I said before, most of them were already sort of educated about and politicized about the issue of mass incarceration because they were all, many of them, were DJs at a local community radio show that has this long multi-decade history of broadcasting into, I think, the seven prisons in the region that are within its listening range. And what they do is they not only take song requests from people who are incarcerated, but they take, the radio takes calls from loved ones who leave shout outs for their people on the inside that the radio show then broadcasts over the radio. And so these folks for years were sort of uh, at a very personal visceral level, like understood the sort of violent work of the prison to really impact on individual lives and families. And so they were deeply politicized around that around the same time that, you know, we saw the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement um, in the area. When USP Letcher gained momentum, I think they understood a fight against the prison as really, um, their terrain on which to struggle. They recognized it as like, like, you know, um, this is our fight. Like, this is how we contribute to the fight against mass incarceration. And so those kind of seemingly distinct groups, in addition to people who were incarcerated, who wound up joining a lawsuit eventually to defeat the prison, all contributed to like multiple rounds of delays of this process that I named before the NEPA process, environmental impact study, so much so that the project got delayed by, by four years, something like that. It had five iterations of that environmental impact statement. And by that time, the sort of like larger political context in the United States had totally shifted. Donald Trump was president. He had other priorities. He was trying to pass the First Step Act. And the project just kind of like lost legitimacy and was defeated. And so its defeat happened, I think, in June 2019. And it's really historic. And I think it's got like important lessons for us to think about. Judah, very quickly, can you tell us what's going on in this wonderful photo that we're looking at? Yeah, sorry. So this is members of the Letcher Governance Project holding up signs, interrupting, that's how Rogers on the stage, the guy, US congressional representative who's brought four, three or four federal prisons to, to the region, to Eastern Kentucky, who is trying to build and bring USP Letcher. One um, sign here that I think is really crucial that I should have said before, so I'm so glad you said this, Jared. Someone is holding up a sign that says, hashtag our 444 million. The Letcher Governance Project, of the many things they did, one of the most consequential was developing this hashtag campaign, which was essentially a way to say the money that the Bureau of Prisons wants to allocate to build this prison, half a billion dollars, we need, right? Like we need money to kind of help build out all kinds of stuff, right? Help us transition away from fossil fuels, help us rebuild our infrastructure, help keep people in our region. But we disavow the prison. We don't want the prison. We don't want it because we stand in sort of solidarity with criminalized communities who will be locked up here. Um, we don't want our loved ones to have to sort of think of themselves as future correctional officers. Um, and so our 444 million became this kind of central plank of their campaign. And you can sort of see it in the record on Twitter, 
Um, and even in the pages of these environmental impact studies, people really, people from around the country writing in and posting about this and kind of grounding their analysis and their critique in this framing. Awesome. Well, that, I mean, this has been so informative. Thank you so, so much, Judah, for um, answering me and Jared's questions. But I think we wanted to get some um, other questions from the crowd now. So anyone who has, Eleanor, did you want to facilitate this section? Okay. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Judah and Jared and Abby. This has been a really fabulous conversation. Um, I see Omar has, is raising your hand. So yeah, anybody who has a question in the audience, feel free to raise your hand. Um, so I know how to unmute. And Omar, happy to start with you. Thank you. you should be able to. Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, going back to the presentation that was given, he mentions um, about treetop removal and stuff like that. And he also mentions that coal companies would find ways to get around that. Do you believe that back in the, like in that era, do you think the coal companies that had as big as enough resources that they do now would like have coercion with the pol with the policy and lawmakers so that they could like do it like incorrectly and still get away with it? Because if they really wanted to help, wouldn't like the lawmakers in the registration like pass legislation to make sure that if they are going to do the tree type removal to do it like properly and um, restore it without just um, um, going at it in that direction? That's such a good question. You know, one of the um, lessons, I suppose, from doing this research and maybe one of the like tragic, tragic lessons is that um, actually mountaintop removal was only enabled because of, uh, an attempted reform at, at um, regulatory change to kind of like rein in strip mining. So like there was this practice of which mountaintop removal is only the most extreme form that's called surface mining or strip mining. And people in central Appalachia and Eastern Kentucky in particular recognized how destructive it was. And through lots of organizing and activism got the federal government to pass something called the Surface Mine Control and Reclamation Act in the 1970s. But un unintentionally, there was this sort of loophole written into the law about, I, it has this very technical language that I think I mentioned offhand about like restoring the approximate original contour of the land being the way that a coal company wouldn't necessarily be responsible for site remediation. And so, Maybe it's a lesson, it's two lessons. It's like a, a lesson about the importance of that terrain of struggle, right? Like they got a, this uh, regulatory law passed and that was really important. And, and it took a lot of coordination and organizing and activism. And also that all of these laws will inevitably produce new contradictions of their own and have places where companies or the state or whomever can sort of exploit, you know, uh, exploit openings. And that's, that's kind of what happened. So I think specifically, like, you're probably right, like they couldn't necessarily get away with it now if that law were sort of like rehashed. And there's, I think there's been some reforms to it. Um, my guess is that there would be a way to sort of expand in some new direction with some new form of, of legislation. Thank you, Omar. Uh, thanks, Judah. Um, we have a question in the Zoom chat from Al Alberta. Um, I can ask it, I can read the question just so we can all hear. Um, unless Alberta, you, if you would like to ask in your own words, you are able to unmute if you want. Um, no pressure. Uh, the question is, do you think that race has played a critical role in the history of prison development within the past 30 years? 
Uh, unequivocally. Hard, yes. Hard agreement. Yes, it has. Um, there's so many ways to kind of answer that. I, I think maybe I would say that like in a very kind of general sense, and we could talk more specifically if, if people are interested. And I guess I would also just invite like Jared and Abby or experts on all of this as well. If there's anything, sorry, that was my email. If there's anything you want to um, add here. I mean, racism is foundational to practices of policing and incarceration. There's no getting around it. It is built in. Uh, it is built into how capitalism developed. It's built into how the state operates. Um, and in all kinds of ways, prisons act as both racializing institutions, that is they continually sort of fabricate and make race, like, right, like they, they um, reaffirm ideas we have about what race is and they, they can sort of shift them, shift those ideas over time. So they are, I think of them as institutions and practices and relationships that actually continue to reify and, and remake race. And they are also racist. <laughs> I mean, they like rely on um, our long history of structural and institutional racism. So there's no, there's no getting around that. Like that has to be kind of central to any kind of understanding of all of this. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Alberta, for that question. Yeah, crucial question. Crucial question. I had a slightly similar question I would love to ask um, just while we're on this theme. Um, I am curious about, I, you sort of touched on it, but you might be able to expand a bit more on the racial makeup of Central Appalachia and just like the different, you know, the way that plays into the carceral economy there. And yeah, just kind of more about that. And then yeah. Yeah, yeah, important question. So I think one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about, but which was really important to me as someone who's not from the region, I'm, I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey and New York City. Um, so one of the things that was really important to me as I, as I did the project was to really ground my understanding of what was happening in the long history of the ways that Central Appalachia has been represented to us, right? And there's a, a literally like a 150 year history of writing about Appalachia that has invented and then solidified particular ideas about the region. And it's kind of remarkably consistent within itself, like representations of the region as this kind of like backward depraved place in the late 19th century are remarkably consistent with the ways that like people like J.D. Vance, if people know who that is, he wrote this, he's a congressional can or a Senate candidate for Ohio. He wrote this New York Times bestselling book, Hillbilly Elegy. He's kind of, a, I'm just gonna say it, he's, a, he's kind of a terrible human being. Um, but he, uh, representations of Appalachia are sort of remarkably consistent. And one of them is that Appalachia is just a place of kind of poor white people. and and there are places where like, that's a true, there's truth to that, right? I mean, Appalachia, parts of Appalachia are incredibly poor and thoroughly white. One of the places that I talked about a little bit, maybe, I don't actually know if I got to talk about it. Martin County, Kentucky, I spend a couple chapters in the book talking about it, was ranked in, um, well, it was the place where the war on poverty was launched. It was the site of like a horrendous coal spill in 2000. It's home to the most expensive federal prison ever built. And in 2019, it was ranked as the worst performing white majority county in the United States. So there's truth to that representation. And at the same time, Eleanor, to get to your question, Appalachia is a very diverse place with a very diverse history. And to the extent, so there's parts of Appalachia that are very multiracial, right? Appalachia extends from New York to Georgia and Alabama, right? So there's parts of Appalachia that are urban, there's parts of Appalachia that are rural, but that have large populations of people of color. Um, and even in those places where it is 
largely white, that's not some primordial feature of the region. That's happened because of various violent practices and policies that pushed out black immigrant and indigenous people at various stages of the last couple hundred years and for different reasons. So it was made to be a place that we think of as white for all kinds of reasons, even though, yeah, there's history there that, that shows us that it wasn't like that. And there's current demographics that show us that it's actually not in fact like that. Thank you so much, Judah. Um, we do have another question. Uh, Carrington. Um, Carrington wrote in the chat, um, from the view of the average person in one of these Eastern Kentucky towns, how did the prisons benefit them, an individual directly? Because it just seems like what the benefits were quite ideological. Such a good question. I think I would say, I'm hesitating, I think, because I don't wanna suggest that people have some kind of like false consciousness, right? Like that's not my intent here at all. Um, I do think that the benefits uh, often do operate at the level of, of ideology in the sense that as you're picking up on, you know, the jobs didn't materialize in any kind of aggregate form. Having said that, you know, a prison opens and it has anywhere from like, depending on the size and whether it's a state prison, private prison, federal prison, whatever, um, you know, any, up, up to maybe 400 jobs. Most of those don't go to local people, right? Most of those jobs go to people that the Bureau of Prisons brings in, but some of them do go to local people. And so to the extent that a local person gets a job at a prison, they and their networks, their families, people they know, whatever, may be able to point to that and say, well, that's a job that wasn't here before, right? That's a person who can stay in the community. That's a person who shops at our local businesses, whose kids go to our schools, who pays taxes, et cetera. So I think to the extent that probably most people in the region know someone who works in a prison or they themselves are, I don't know, connected to uh, the prison economy. There are maybe some economic benefits that they themselves are proximate to if they don't experience it themselves. Um, in addition to having a, a, a more ideological sense of the benefit that the prison brings. I'll say one more quick thing because I know we, we wanna be sure to, to end soon. Something I didn't mention that's also occurring here are jails that are expanding. They have a different kind of relationship to the economy, um, which is probably too technical and detailed to get into at the moment. But I will just say that jails are expanding. They're expanding not necessarily because they're holding rural people who are incarcerated in them or holding more of them. There's definitely some of them who are locked up for sure. But they're expanding also because they're holding almost half of the state of Kentucky, at least, Department of Corrections population. So they're holding half of the people you would expect to be in a state prison in a county jail. What that's doing is bringing in payments from the state or actually also from federal agencies like ICE who also house people in county jails and bringing in revenue to help a given county keep its jail doors open, employ people to work there, whatever. So it's another material way that this kind of vast carceral geography has some um, impact, if not direct benefit to folks. And so some people, to get to, back to Carrington's question, some people may recognize that or have some relationship to it and, and recognize that there's some material impact or benefit happening here through the jails in addition to the prisons. If I could jump on that real quick, I'd like to weave together um, a few of actually my students' questions. Nice work, everyone. Um, it, to get you to talk about this idea that you write very compellingly about in the book, 
uh, which you call uh, carceral social reproduction. Um, and so we've had a question about the role that race played in the history of the development of the prison. Um, and Carrington's question about, okay, well, what exactly, what exactly are people getting out of this? Why do they consent to this, right? Um, and now we have a question from Chastity about um, the, the, the role that mass incarceration plays in poor communities, right? And I think that these all kind of combine to ask the question of, you know, how did we get stuck with such a narrow horizon um, for what it means to be prosperous, what it means to be safe, right? Um, how did these communities get to such a point where they're willing to allow, you know, a mountaintop to be destroyed and a prison to be built and the surrounding environment to be ruined, all in the name of what might amount to a, a dozen, a few dozen jobs. And they've seen this happen elsewhere, and so they might not even have any illusions about what's going on. I mean, it's a, a crucial question. Um, I think I would answer it in maybe a, a in the, I think the short answer might just be like, people want to, you know, like people don't necessarily want to leave where they're from, right? Where they're, and we shouldn't ask them to, right? You're from a particular area. Your people have lived there for a long time. It's beautiful. Um, it's where your family is and you want to do what you can to stick around, right? And to make a life there. As, in, as was sort of embedded in your question, Jared, like in this moment, what we could sort of like abstractly and sort of fancily call like a carceral conjuncture, like a moment really characterized by our reliance on mass incarceration. The prisons are what's on offer, right? Like that is what is proposed. That is what Hal Rogers and other people suggest to these communities to attach their futures to. And when your options are leaving your community, driving an hour or two, maybe to one of the few remaining coal mining jobs, maybe getting a job at like the dollar store or a Walmart, but those are also sort of few and far between, or getting a job as a correctional officer at a jail or a prison, um, which are somewhat plentiful, right? Even as we're also acknowledging that those, those jobs don't materialize in the way that we and other people might imagine they do. It's not hard to see how people would be like, well, this isn't what I necessarily imagined or want for my community, but this is how we keep people here. This is how we get water upgrades. This is how we um, pave our roads, right? This is how we reproduce ourselves, right? This is this kind of concept of carceral social reproduction. It's the idea of these communities really attaching the idea of their futures in the region to the prospect of the prison, which is a really somewhat demoralizing and challenging notion, I think, where I sort of go to, right, to challenge that is that work that happened in Letcher County, which was also on the grounds of social reproduction. People saying, no, like, we wanna stay here. Like, this is our community. Like, we're not trying to leave. Like, we're in and of this place and thoroughly Appalachian and we demand better than this, you know? And I should say, maybe we can end on this note, that hashtag, our 444 million that I talked about, when I said before that people wrote in and framed their ideas of opposition to the prison through that hashtag, what I meant was people said, people wrote in and talked about, uh, all the other things that they could do in Eastern Kentucky besides build a prison, right? Which ranged from everything from like building solar farms to investing in drug rehabilitation to building, you know, um, elements that go into cancer research and cancer treatment to, you know, all kinds of other shit. So the imagination is there, you know? Um, and I think people's will is there for something different and, and there's, indications of people sort of doing the work to kind of scale that up and, and push back against um, the idea that prisons are what people should expect and what they should, um, yeah, what they should expect and what they deserve. Thank you so much, Judah. Um, Thank you all so much. I think, um, 
we can have our final question from my colleague Raven and then turn to poetry. So Raven, if you want to ask your question, go ahead. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so my question is, um, how long is an acknowledgement an acknowledgement? And do you think that conversations like these, like this contribute to the dismantling of the system? Because I feel like, I don't know, there's so often everybody's like, okay, well, this is wrong. This is, you know, but then it's like, okay, so what is the course of action? I know that no, nobody really has that answer specifically, but it's just like, a question so do you mean like at what point is just acknowledging that there's a problem a problem in and of itself and like how do we move towards doing something different yes exactly yeah i would say two things i would say i i get frustrated by what people call like analysis paralysis where it's like we're just gonna come or like talk this shit to death and not actually do something, you know what I mean? Um, but there's another feeling I have, which is kind of in tension with that, which is that it actually really matters that we get the analysis right. Like lots of people sort of jump on, um, you know, an easy target like private prisons or something like that, which in the grand scheme of mass incarceration are um, an easy target and important to target, but like not all that foundational to the sustainability of mass incarceration. Like we could end all private prisons tomorrow and still have mass incarceration, we would, right? So there's all kinds of ways that I think it really matters to spend the time doing the kind of like deep study to understand these issues. But that deep study on its own or just motivated by like understanding a problem better for like an academic purpose to me, um, it's not the reason I do this. And I don't think the reason why people sh should do this. I think we're, we're motivated by political concerns and political questions and political imperatives. And that's why we do the work. And so the work, to me, this work on these kinds of issues has to be done kind of in conversation with people who are struggling against it, you know? Um, so I, the work that I've done has kind of always been, like I, I write and I teach, but I also am involved in various ways in a lot of the things that I write about. And to me, that's that's the only way to the only way to sort of do it. Yeah, if I could add real quick, like there's a lot of campaigns on the local level all across the country. Um, and I think that they do benefit from having a sharp analysis uh, because um, the 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 prison uh, builders, um, the various actors who campaign for the incorporate uh, for the construction of prisons um, have been able to incorporate a lot of um, social justice language, a lot of progressive language. Judah's first book, and this is how I know about Judah, is the amazing progressive punishment, which uh, was written oh, about ten years ago, but does does a really good job of demonstrating how uh, prison construction is able to use this progressive language in a way that could actually um, catch a lot of people off guard. And uh, actually, Abby and I know each other uh, from a campaign in New York um, uh, five or six years ago against a very similar thing. We're gonna build all these new jails, but they're not really gonna be jails. They're gonna be social service centers and all the rest of it. And so I think that having a sharp analysis and just keeping track of what's going on all over the country, because these people are certainly talking to each other, um, is a good way um, to not fall for for any real obvious traps in the in the, the necessary campaigns to oppose uh, carceral construction um, and to uh, to fight uh, the the police uh, all over the country. Thank you. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your really thoughtful and provocative questions. It has been a really really rich conversation. Um, we do have a tradition here at the rail of ending our events with a poetry reading. Um, and today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Ryder Alsop, to the stage. Ryder is the co-founder of Porosity Press and Bailfront.com. Her audio documentary work has been featured on NPR, CBC, Vox, and New York Magazine. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Ryder. So happy to have you reading. 
Yeah, thank you, Eleanor, and um, for everyone else for this great conversation. Um, I am just going to really quickly introduce the text that I'm going to be reading from. Um, so I work um, with Tyler Morris on Bailfront, which is an online storefront that sells donated items for bail. We are always looking for more donated items. It's mostly books because that's who we know. But if you have any to donate, please get in touch. Uh, and then Prosody Press, which um, publishes authors that are like the weird nonprofit word is like system impacted. Uh, and then we like also all of the books we publish are free to people inside. Um, and so starting in March of this year, we were operating a remote workshop, writing workshop um, with about 10 authors inside prisons across the nation. Um, the object of that workshop was that we would like collectively choose a canonical text and rewrite it together and then publish both like the submitted writing um, and the process of doing that in a book that will come out with Wendy Subway. Um, and so like part of like that process was because like people inside are not allowed to communicate with each other directly, we had to mail or email um, our workshop materials and they would write us back and then we would um, compile all of that writing into roundups and send them out like resulting in like 300 400 um, pages of like exchange and so right now we're in the process of like editing that down um, so I'm going to read from that excerpt and most of actually in this excerpt that I chose today like none of the words are mine um, but you can like I'll say their name before uh, so you'll know like who's reading or like who I'm reading. All right. Um, so this is Rain. When we discuss our process or method, I think it's important that we ask ourselves what the point of all this is. Why bring together what, 20 writers into a remote space? If we're going to parcel work out in an anthology fashion, I really feel we miss an opportunity there, an opportunity to show a work that exhibits remarkable unity, despite the many barriers separating the writers from one another, some of which are quite physical and quite imposing. What are we trying to accomplish and why does it need us? Why does this project benefit from having people working together all across the continent, many of whom aren't even capable of communicating with one another directly? And when it's all said and done, what will we have proven? What will be remarkable about our efforts? I don't doubt we can do some incredible things using our individual voices, but I believe we can surpass that when we weave these voices together. Greg, there's so much canonical literature, as you stated, where the hell do we begin? I'm just gonna sit tight and follow your lead. However, it remains to be seen what writing style and principle I will adopt in this workshop. I will do my best to contribute to the project, work with the team, challenge myself in a critical analysis of text and porous any piece of literature from the canon. The biggest porous project in history. Just expressing my confidence to succeed in whatever you throw at me. Bernard, the only two texts I read before was the Bible, did my family being Christians, and the Divine Comedy by, Don by Dante. My priest let me some reading material on him. I am curious about stories involving demons, even when all the added, with all the added nonsense. When I saw Aristotle on the list, I said to myself, I don't wanna see his work. It comes from him saying people are naturally born slaves, that it was just and to everyone's benefit. Rain, regarding our choice of texts, I really do wish we could review the top two responses of our fellow participants. It would feel like more of a conversation, more of a group effort. And we'd be able to make our individual decisions in consideration of one another's thoughts. The same is true regarding process. I know we're time constrained, but a pool seems so cold and detached from the kind of community we're capable of forming. Just my two cents, of course. Jennifer, I'd love to rewrite a text I despise, like the Bible, or perhaps the Crucible, which I don't despise and haven't read. But what if the Salem witch hunts had been in a matriarchy society that targeted men? Just a thought. Jason, porous texts or the making of such, to me, is about discovering voice. A porous object lets in more light than from an optimist view, more water from steerage on the Titanic. A person, too, is porous. Reader and writer, meeting or not, and discovering an intersection of familiarity that they both respectively may meet at or not. Bernard, 
I know it's all collective effort, but I've already had a couple of friends say they'd love to read what I've written, and that got me a little excited. I smiled when I typed that. I'm excited to introduce part of who I am to the world, to work with new comrades as well as some familiar names. I feel at home with you all. It means a lot to be with you. I know this response came slow. Rain. The kind of collaboration I'm most excited about is the kind that allows me to work with people I can't even touch, as if they were right beside me, using a voice we found together even though we've never heard one another speak. There's something powerful about the remote nature of our collective. Greg, my purpose in the workshop is to learn a different style of writing, become the next Edgar Allan Poe. Anyone with literary ambitions knows that motivations, both great and small, that impel the hand to write comes from real life. The desire to describe my pain of love, my pain of living, and the anguish of death. There is a need for me to express my voice to the humble. Every day I wonder when something will shift inside of me. I need the passion I once had before, to understand the preamble in myself and learn to fill those spaces. Amber, I kind of feel lost in the sauce with the conversation of what text pairs with, with what does it mean to make porous? What making porous means will inevitably be different depending on the text selected and the rewriter's approach. So I feel like there's a lot of conversation going on which will be rendered mute as soon as we actually select the specific text to work with. For example, I've rewritten the folktale Little Match Girl, where I set it to poetry and turned the matches she was selling into a metaphor for selling drugs and sex work. I can send you a copy if you think it might be helpful. Greg, Ryder, I'm sorry about the miscommunication. This kiosk is snatching all of my emails, saved writings and all my photos are gone. I'm so tired of these tablets, the kiosk and JPay all together. I'm tired of losing my work. It's not just work from and for the project. I've lost my most important emails with information from my parole packet. This is one of the reasons why my work is not being sent on time. I'm just tired of the rewriting and what I've written isn't even the complete work. I never get to finish. Every time I connect the USB to download my emails, it deletes my stuff. Bernard, hi, I tried to do this as quickly as possible without timeline in mind. I'm still waiting on my new JP6, J JP6, which I really need because I have no way of charging this one. They wouldn't let me have my charger cord because people kept getting caught with phones and the cords which were used to charge them. The JP6 has a different charger piece. Anyways, I'll try to get this out as soon as I possibly can. I hope life's been good for you too. I tried to call Thursday, but couldn't get through. We were on lockdown yesterday after a guy got into a fight. I'll keep pushing for us. Rain, I'm interested in hearing about the results of your last check-in with the Wendy subway team. As far as process ephemera are concerned, I received emails and responses are all part of a conversation. I simply co copy and paste everything chronologically into a document. We did not do that. I might use a different font color to help distinguish speakers. We might contextualize the text with emphasis on milestone decisions, such as choice of text, porous approach, and design details. We might also include summaries of phone conversations. On top of all this, we'd include a description of challenges faced, such as phone approvals, mail rejections, mail delays, the chronological disorder of emailed materials, and the periods of time spent waiting for both electronic and snail mail replies. We might also include the challenge of your two-person organized team in juggling all our responses, keeping us updated and coordinating with the workshop facilitators and communicating relevant responses to them, all while keeping up with your day jobs. We could also collect data from participants in the end about any challenges they faced and how they impacted participation, such as the heat or issues with neighbors. All this could be edited down and distilled, but that's what I have in mind. Greg. I was thinking of you today and I wanted to make another suggestion as to how you could coordinate the workshop in present and future. Let's call this your pilot program. Like every test program, you introduce your intention, what you want to accomplish, what material you want to cover in the time of completion. Stop writing down so much material. Only provide material about the author and his or her prior work. Stay in the tunnel. I will send the second half of the morning because the kiosk broke again. That's all, thank you. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much, Ryder. That was a really, really perfect way to end the conversation today. So thank you. Um, and thank you so much again, Jared. Thank you, Judah. Thank you, Abby. Uh, thanks all of you for joining us here today and for your amazing questions. 
And we would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and for their support of our archive, which you can check out on our YouTube channel. And for the past 22 years, the Rotham Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics in our monthly publication and in our public events, just like here on our daily NSC. So please check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers, editors, and operations here at the rail. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Faith Wilding and Charlotte Kent on the event of Faith's show being like leads at Bordelami Gallery. We will be concluding with a poetry reading by Coleman Stevenson. And now everyone can turn on their microphones and say hello and goodbye as you Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much you. knowledge today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Jared. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Ryder. That was amazing. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Care, everybody. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Take Take care. Care.